Roman Catholic Church, the largest Christian uh, church and one of the oldest institutions in history, is over 1.2 billion members strong and maintains a significant presence in every corner of the globe. The Catholic Church played a monumental and necessary role in the development of Western civilization. The Church brought us remarkable progress in the fields of language, science, music, art, architecture, and philosophy. It's no surprise that the Church's traditions have endured for millennia. St. Peter was the first pope, and there have since been 265 popes, with Pope Francis being the 266th. In my lifetime alone, there have been five popes, including Pope, France, including pope France, Francis. When the new pope is being chosen, the entire world becomes captivated. They remain transfixed to their television screens, watching Lisa La Flamme. And there's throngs of people just waiting for that white smoke, sometimes even in the rain, focused on that modest chimney at the top of the Sistine Chapel. The allure of this single event, the simplicity of the gentle white smoke billowing from the tiny chimney has the power to enthrall billions. And it re represents so much for so many people. It represents change. It represents consensus, and it represents a new stage in the resilient tradition of the Catholic Church. I'd like to thank the Cardinal for agreeing to speak at the club today, as we are all ready to hear his story of the inside. <laughs> Anna Maria Tremonti is the, world, is the host of CBC Radio 1's most popular news magazine radio program, The Current. She's a former foreign correspondent and war correspondent who spent close to a decade posted in Berlin, London, Jerusalem, and Washington. She'll be interviewing uh, our, our keynote speaker after he gives a few remarks. Please welcome Anna Maria Tremonti. Born and raised in Guelph, Ontario, Thomas Collins was ordained a priest in 1973. He was named Bishop of St. Paul, Alberta in 1997 and Archbishop of Edmonton in 1999. Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict uh, the 16th appointed Archbishop, call, uh, appointed Archbishop Collins, uh, the 10th Archbishop of Toronto in December 2006. On February 18th, 2012, he was elevated to the College of Cardinals in Rome. Cardinal Collins was one of the three Canadian cardinals that participated in the 2013 conclave to elect the Pope. Thomas Cardinal Collins is the fourth cardinal in the history of the Archdiocese of Toronto and the 16th in Canadian history to do that. Today, His Eminence joins the ranks of distinguished cardinals who have already spoke to the club in the past. Uh, cardinal Mercier in 1919, Cardinal Villeneuve, in 1941, Cardinal Leger in 1974, Cardinal Carter in 1979, Cardinal Casaroli in 1984, and Cardinal Ambrosic in 2003. We are highly honored to have our esteemed speaker speak to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Cardinal Cole. Thank, thank you very much, Noble. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I wish to extend my gratitude to the Empire Club of Canada for inviting me to speak once again in this setting. In May of 2007, uh, just a few months after becoming Archbishop of Toronto, I spoke to the Empire Club on the topic of the contribution of religion to society. And six years later, we're still diligently working away within the Archdiocese of Toronto to make uh, a deep contribution and a profound one to society. And I believe that uh, this is uh, central to the mission of every faith group. At, as Canada's largest diocese, uh, the Archdiocese of Toronto has about 1.9 million members. 
225 uh, churches, and we celebrate Mass every Sunday in more than 30 different languages. It is truly a sign of the universality of the church and of the reality of Toronto uh, as a place where the whole world comes together. I am very blessed to lead our faith community and to work together with friends representing many different religions in the greater Toronto area, motivated by our beliefs to assist others, strengthening families in our cities and our country. Since I last joined you, I am now wearing red a lot more often. Although I find in the TTC, this is difficult getting through the turnstiles, but I thought it would, it would be probably appropriate to, when talking about the conclave to appear in the more formal outfit. Uh, I was appointed to the College of Cardinals back in 2012. Cardinals wear scarlet robes, not just to stand out at social functions, but more importantly, as a reminder of the blood shed by those who have been and are being martyred for their faith. Sadly, this is still happening in many parts of the world where living one's faith publicly can result in violence or even in death. One of my heroes is Cardinal John Fisher, whose feast day is this coming Saturday, June the 22nd. He shares this feast with his friend Thomas More, who was martyred a few days after him in 1535 on the orders of Henry VIII. Just a few weeks ago, I went to the airport to welcome a family of refugees forced to flee their homeland because of persecution. Many, many people seek refuge from persecution in our country. Many of the parishes of our archdiocese are sponsoring refugees who remind us through their suffering of how we can take faith for granted. So while my day job is to serve the people of the Archdiocese of Toronto, the most high profile task of a cardinal is of course to elect the successor of St. Peter. When a Pope dies, or as we witnessed for the first time in about 600 years, this past February when a Pope retires. Now there are plenty of novels and screenplays about the conclave experience. It's a real thriller packed with backroom deals, plotting, scheming, jostling for power. No, not quite. It's really quite the opposite. It's, Perhaps a visual of 115 cardinals in quiet prayer wouldn't be quite as exciting, but that's more what it really is. When one enters the Sistine Chapel to vote for the Pope, the spiritual leader who will shepherd the world's more than a billion Catholics, it is indeed an overwhelming experience. I remember I've seen so many times the uh, pictures of the procession with the chanting of the Litany of the Saints as the Cardinals go two by two and turn in. But it was amazing. You're going along and then you make this left turn and you look ahead and there's the Sistine Chapel. It was, oh, wow, <laughs> it's just amazing. And, and it's, it's astonishing when they close the door, you know, clunk, and you realize oh, it's just us. We begin to vote. But I think in many ways the most moving moment is when you would come up and we take the ballot. I'll show you one. I brought one of the ballots along. But uh, a little show and tell. But you take the ballot and you hold it up and you walk in a procession towards the altar. Then you look up at the last judgment and you say, I testify before Jesus Christ who will judge me that the one I am voting for is the one I truly believe should be elected. Then you put it in the container and go back to your place. It's, it's very moving. All of us cardinals were also very conscious of the prayers of people around the world supporting us as we fulfilled our mission. First of all, we had the very intense series of about 10 different meetings uh, where each cardinal spoke about the needs of the church and what they felt the new pope should be. And many of us began by saying, knowing that the next pope is here, we would say this. <laughs> And then, of course, the conclave itself, when we were able to get away to an oasis of prayer in the midst of all the intense excitement and then enter into that spiritual moment, which is the election of a pope. But we weren't alone in all this. Of course, there were over 6,000 journalists from every corner of the globe came to Rome for the conclave and because billions of people just uh, there being attentive to this. It was a great opportunity to experience this most moving event. And I'm very grateful for all those who helped share that story with the world. In today's media culture of breaking news and Twitter and stories evolving by the nanosecond, people around the world sat glued to their screens, staring at a chimney, waiting for smoke signals. There's something kind of beautiful about that. 
all that multi-million dollar equipment looking at Jimmy for smoke signals. So this afternoon, uh, Anna Maria Tremonti will be interviewing me and we'll be talking together, and I hope I can share a few brief insights into the experience of the Conclave. Uh, now just remember, I can be excommunicated if I say too much, so I'll try, I'll try to be careful about that. But then again, you know how it all ended. Pope Francis was elected and we can look ahead to a new pontificate where the Holy Father will, like those before him, bring his own unique gifts and talents and personality to the papacy. We pray for him and for all leaders throughout the world. Whether elected in the Sistine Chapel or serving in other forms of leadership, uh, we pray for those uh, who are entrusted with care for the people and uh, pray that their love and care for the common good may be a blessing for us all. And so now, we will. I'll bring my little uh, show and tell along. We won't look at one another, we'll look at that way. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll steal a glance at you though, because okay. um, I, I do want to be careful. You, you, of course, will stop me then before I get you excommunicated, will you? I'll, 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 look, I'll look pale first of all, and then I okay. will, I will I'll sputter a bit, and then, then I will uh, I'll You can say give you no comment. I'll, I'll try that, I've tried that on occasion. I, I, I will need you to be very candid for this very first question about the conclave. <clears throat> okay. Um, how was the food? It was okay. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty good, you know. It's, it's very good food. <laughs> you were in Rome. <laughs> I was in Rome. Actually, I think, though, I shouldn't be criticizing the food of Casa Santa Marta because the Pope is living there now. But uh, no, it was very good. It was very nice. Um, you did bring uh, a ballot oh, yes, with you, yes. and perhaps you can tell us because it is uh, mm -hmm. that you also have a pen. But go through. Well, what I'll, you're I'll tell you this is this is the ballot that you you have for Pope. You get to keep these things, by the way. The Cardinal Ray, who's in charge, just as soon as the Pope got elected, he started heading out, ready to go out to the balcony. He said, "Oh, you could take anything at your place." So I, everyone just grabbed it all, <laughs> and then the, the masters of ceremonies. He said, "Sit down. You sit down." So we all sat down. Well, the Pope went out. I guess they didn't want us showing up and people could guess who was the Pope. And then we thought, why are we sitting down? So we all headed for the windows, but grabbing things as they went. But yeah, this is what the ballot looks like. And it's, uh, it's just a folded piece of paper card like that. It says, Eligo in sumum pontificum, I elect as sovereign pontiff. And then there's a line. And you just uh, write in a name. And every cardinal has at, a, at his place a, a kind of a, a list of all the 115 cardinals. 114 of whom get to go home. Uh, but you have the list there, and they, um, when uh, you go up to vote, you just, uh, this is what they provide. This is the pen you use to vote for Pope. <laughs> um, I was kind of taken aback. Maybe it was the spirit of Pope Francis, you know, this, the simplicity and uh, poverty, uh, sort of, but it's a, it's a little blue uh, kind of um, ballpoint pen. <laughs> With the, what got me, when you see the, you look up and you see Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo and the whole, and I, the barcode is what got me. That was, <laughs> it was the barcode. I couldn't believe it. So, so have you what, had someone read that barcode? Maybe it's special. Oh, it might be. Maybe this is a secret message for who to vote for. I don't know. But I, I wrote a little note here just to prove this is the real thing. And I said this. Well, I give the this Pilot G207 pen number da 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 da. A little ad here for them is one of the pens placed with each cardinal's place in the Sistine Chapel for the conclave of 2013. So there it is. That's a little bit of history there. <laughs> but it's it's really interesting because you have this thing, and there's no nominations for Pope. You don't sort of have people aren't running for Pope; they're running away from being Pope, because as I said, 114 of us go home and one of us doesn't. So um, you you just have the first night. You have the first only one vote and you get it scattered all over, like one vote, two vote, three votes. So there's some with 20 or 30 or what, and then one or two or three. So you, get a, you find out then who the papabili really are, the people who might actually end up being pope. And you don't know before that, because uh, there was a, a thing in one of the blogs about the election, uh, um, the buzz meter about who was getting media buzz. And I looked at the end, Bergoglio was number 42 on the list. So, you know, 
but that's how you that's how they do it well i, that, I want to ask more about oh, that sure. so mm -hmm. so the very first ballot is like an open ballot you mm -hmm. can like you you're all technically running yeah everybody you just in fact you could just put in uh, i guess the name of anyone but it, it's almost the last seven or eight hundred years it's always been one of the cardinals and so you just write print in the name and then you start, it's, it's organized, if you look at the Sistine Chapel, there are four rows, the first row, the second on that side, and then the back row and the, the one closest in. So it's, and you just, by rank, from the cardinal bishops, cardinal priests, cardinal deacons, and the most junior cardinals near the door, he shuts the door and he burns the ballot. So, so there's, the, so you go up row by row and you hold the ballot up like this, and then you walk up and each one goes up to the altar and says that prayer and drops it in. One of the cardinals was, uh, was unable to walk, and so once everyone had voted, there are three scrutineers and three revisers who are sitting at a table they bring in, and one of the scrutineers went down to his place and he said the prayer, and then the scrutineer took the ballot and walked up and dropped it in for him. So, uh, so you just keep doing that. And so once you have the first ballot, you know roughly who's somebody, you're pretty close to who's going to be the pope. Then you go back home, have a nice meal, and talk a lot in the corridors and things like that. You're, you're trying to, people are saying, well, what do you think of this? What? And of course, in the week before, there have been a lot of that kind of conversation too. And then the next day, you just uh, keep voting. We had mass the next morning in the room we came from for that procession. And then we went in and did another vote and another vote. And then you can sort of see it shifting around. By that time, you're down to very few. And then we went and had lunch. And then we came back, and by that time we were, you know, thinking, well, so then I went back a bit early, and um, in the chapel there's a place for prayer with the Blessed Sacrament, and the, the place was filled with the cardinals. They were all quietly slipping in there. Then we just left one by one, and then a couple more votes, and there we are. Just like that. And but once we got to the last one, he needed, he needed 77 votes to get elected. It has to be two-thirds. So we were checking away, and I, I figured this might be it. You never know. So I do one, two, three, four, slash. One, two, three. And you got 115 cardinals all doing that. Although I don't think Cardinal Bergoglio, look, he wasn't, he seemed to be distracted. I don't know what, but anyway, we were doing that. And then when you get to, you know, we we're to 76, and then they, his name came out 77, and then we all clapped, and then we just continued voting till they, all the votes were, were counted. So when that process is going on, you are in the conclave, you're in the Sistine yes. Chapel, yeah. and you have desks? Each yes. of you has a desk? It's a long, like, bench, like a long tables. There are four long tables all connected. You, you have your place with a, a kind of a, a place card with your name, uh, and then on it you have a big, a kind of a blotter that you get to keep to, and below is, <laughs> is these two sheets with the names of all the cardinals and a, a few ballots and the pen. Um, and then so you sit there, and uh, I had uh, Cardinal Alan Cherry on one side and Cardinal Duca from Prague and Cardinal Alan Cherry from India, and we will always be together because you go by seniority and we're, we're in that, that place. So they just go up. The most senior cardinal under 80 was this Cardinal Ray. Uh, he would be the first to, to go, and Cardinal Harvey, who's the most junior cardinal, would be the last. But you just go up row by row. And as each row rises and goes up, the next row gets ready, and then you just follow along. And cardinals over the age of 80 are not allowed they're, they're to vote? They're not allowed to vote. Um, they used to be, uh, but Pope Paul VI changed that. He felt it'd probably be wise uh, to be able, to, in a sense, to retire from being an active cardinal. And in fact, they were just simply completely, at that point, not even to show up. They were just, but Pope John Paul made a very wise move. He kept the rule, the 80 rule. So if your birthday, if you turn 80, uh, before the Pope, the see is vacant. It isn't, there was one cardinal who was 80, but he had turned 80 after the see was vacant, so he could still vote. Uh, but if you, only those under 80 can vote. But the ones over 80 can come to the pre-conclave, which was the week before when we were going to those meetings to see pictures of cardinals going into the Vatican and all that. That's a whole different thing. That's a, a there's a big kind of a, arena type, like, a, like an amphitheater type thing with computerized things, computerized voting, you know, yes, no, and flings flashing on screens and the whole bit. The real thing, we just use paper and smoke signals. But, um, but all the cardinals can come to that part. And in fact, it was suggestions of some of the much older cardinals that, the one, like for example, Pope Francis has set up this group of eight cardinals 
to help advise him. And that was a suggestion that came up during that pre-conclave when all the cardinals could come. And so during the pre-conclave, is that when you get an idea in your discussions with other cardinals about who um, you might want to be looking at to lead you as pope in terms of uh, different issues the church faces? And did, like, yeah. Is that when you discuss amongst yourselves mm -hmm. and get an idea of who might be in the running? That's, that's, when, that's when that happens. Of course, it should happen all the time, too. Uh, one of the roles of a cardinal is to know the other cardinals. It's sort of your responsibility as a cardinal is to get to know all the others all the time. But it's certainly, that's a focused period. And what would happen is every one of the, there will be 150, 160 cardinals for that part. There are only 115 under the age of 80 who voted, but about 150 or so. Uh, and each cardinal got to speak if they wanted to. And you put in your name, and about two days later, you get to speak. It's a sort of a, but you could, you've got five minutes. Um, and uh, they bring the little microphone up, and you have a, there's a translation thing. So the cardinal spoke in mostly Italian, but also French, German, Spanish, English, uh, I think it might have been a Portuguese, there were different, different languages. Um, and it went on and on. It's a mind-numbing experience. You're sitting there, these beautiful big chairs, like, and, and the, in front of you, there's these, I don't know, somewhere hidden in the ceiling are these little cameras, and you're facing a wall which has these flat screen TVs. And Cardinal Sedano and Cardinal Ray who are, and Bertoni who were presiding or, or facing you, but above you, you see these. So you see the person who's speaking, but he may be behind you. And you just go on and on, one after another. Um, and, but each one, it's, it's sort of 10 sessions of many, many hours. So you're just sitting there listening, listening to these. But it's very interesting. You realize how much experience there is in that room. You know, these people have been through all kinds of things and often would speak of uh, some of the very uh, dangerous uh, situations of the world. And, and then we had reports mixed through it on the different departments of the Vatican. They would kind of uh, fill us in on that. And so it went on and on like that. So that's one, the formal part. Uh, but then we'd have the coffee break. So some of us suggest we should have three hour coffee breaks and 10 minute uh, sessions. But, <laughs> because at the coffee breaks, you just talk more candidly. And then in the evenings, it's amazing how much Italian dining was being done during the evenings. We'd go out to these gatherings. People would be invited to different gatherings. And, and I think what I think they, uh, of course I can't say exactly what was said, but people sitting around, a bunch of cardinals sitting around and saying, okay, what about this place? What about that place? You know, what, uh, what about this person, that person? You know, it, it, it is, this is going on constantly. How does a cardinal who wants to be pope signal that? Um, well, if he did, he would never end up as Pope, I don't think. <laughs> I, I don't think, there may be some cardinals who want to be Pope. Uh, that would be a very strange desire. Because uh, really? remember, the rest of us go home. He's, he's gonna, as he says, the Pope Francis said, all my friends are 14 hours away. You know, we just say goodbye. And remember, he wasn't exactly joking when he said at the meal, uh, when we, right after the, May God forgive you for what you've done, you know, so. And the room you go in to put the white robes on is called the Room of Tears. So it's, uh, everyone's running away from it. It's sort of like those things, you know, where you, who's, who gets uh, last, you know. You, well, but, because to be the Pope is also a burden. Well, huh? it is, it is quite a, it's a heavy responsibility. And, um, and it's, a, it's an awesome responsibility. And, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful mission in the church. But um, I think uh, everyone so, is so conscious of the awesome nature of being a successor, uh, not of Pope Benedict or of Pope John Paul, but a successor of St. Peter, that it's, uh, it's quite an awesome thing. And I don't think anyone who is aware of all that would not be seeking to put themselves in that position. It has happened in the past. And that's, those have been the bad times of the church's history. But I think, uh, and partly too, although it's sometimes when we had this, this uh, political, uh, you know, it was a prince in Europe and all that, people would be, that was a horrible intrusion into the real life of the church. But that's been gone, fortunately, for quite some time. So is there no lobbying as we would know it on a political level? Is there a subtle kind of lobbying? Is there, what, like, what, what can you tell us about what goes on in the mm -hmm. discussions where, you know, uh, well, one, one regional group might mm -hmm. want to see themselves represented? Well, I think certainly there is, in a sense, in that sense, 
I don't think any, any, it's certainly true that any, you don't have a particular cardinal saying, okay, could you see how many votes we got here or there and all that. That's just not the way it is. It's a whole different kind of thing. But you certainly do have the cardinal saying, well, what about this one? What about that one? This is going on all the time during that pre-conclave. Uh, is he good with this? Let's say administration. Would he be able to deal with the challenges we're facing? Is he, you know, what do you know about him? Have you been? And it's amazing. Uh, when you get all those people together, a lot of them have been with a lot of the other ones. You know, you, oh, I remember I went to his diocese uh, for a while, and he was really good with this, or really good with that. And so you, you pick up beyond what you already know from maybe having read people's books or learned about them before. So that's going on all the time. And I think you do have uh, people, maybe somebody who's very impressed by a particular cardinal and say, this is the one who should really be the pope. He's really what we, and they will maybe talk to others about that. So you have several people you know, offering suggestions, and that's happening all the time. You make the point that you were all speaking different languages. Is there a time in the chapel where you speak only one language? Well, in the chapel itself, most of this speaking happens in the pre-conclave. Uh, and then we all went to our parishes, because cardinals are all in charge of a parish in Rome. So the Sunday before, we went to our people to be with the people of our parish. For me, it's St. Patrick's Parish. San Patrizio, and then we went into the conclave to vote for their bishop. But, but in the conclave itself, uh, it's very different. You, for one thing, when you go into this big hotel, Santa Martha, you go down below, and they go through like going into an airport. They have screening, you put bags go through the thing, and they, 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 and they, they take away your cell phones. Um, it doesn't matter anyway, because they, they blocked the whole thing around. But once you get actually into the conclave, there's hardly any talking at all. Um, there's prayer in Latin, and then Cardinal Ray would speak, who was the senior cardinal, would speak in Italian. Uh, but we all know what we're doing because it's all in the book. So once he said, we begin to vote, basically, we all just write the name and start walking up to the altar. And then you call out. Once all the votes are taken, they, they bring the thing down onto this table where you have the three, the cardinals are chosen by lot, who are the, uh, the uh, scrutineers and the revisers, and they just, first they count the ballots, just uno, duo, tre, quattro, so it's in Italian, and they put them into the next, the other kind of container, and then they start calling them out. And one looks at it, passes it to the second cardinal who looks at it, and passes it to the third cardinal who reads it out loud. So there's a triple check that it's the actual name. And then everyone goes, check, and then you just keep going like that. So, How old were you the first time you walked into the Sistine Chapel? How old was that? How old were you the first time you ever went there? Oh, I think I went there when I, I was studying in Rome from 1975 to 1978. So uh, I would have been in my 30s then. Yeah. I'm just, I, I'm trying to get an idea of when you went way back then and yeah. like would it ever have occurred to you that you would be in that place again one day voting no. for the public? Oh, no, never. I, but I, in 1978, I'd always wanted to be there at a conclave. Because, but what I'm thinking of is what I'll, I'll never get to see, I guess. Uh, well, maybe until I'm over 80. But if I make it that far, you know. Um, but the, you know, the crowd, the excitement, the people rushing to the square, the, the white smoke and all that. So in 1978, I returned home in June, and there were two conclaves that year, but I missed them both. That was so I've never, Pope, the, John, Pope Paul John Paul the first and, and Pope John the Paul the second. second. Well, uh, let me ask you about that, because when we saw those pictures, even if you're here in Canada, you watch those pictures and you see the crowd and you can feel yeah. the excitement. Could you feel the excitement of the crowd through those walls? Well, you certainly had a sense of that, um, because we knew what would be happening out there. We knew people were there. Um, uh, we didn't know about the pigeon or dove that was on the white, uh, the, the child, but we knew mostly what was out there. And we also knew it was raining, and, and there were a group of people coming up. After the Pope was chosen, the cardinals go up to greet him, and also some other people. But the Pope, uh, you know, basically said, we've got to get out onto the balcony there. They're out there in the rain. So um, they went out to, uh, you know, to be blessed them. So we knew a bit about that. But in the, you're very cut off at the Sistine Chapel. You just, it's just the 115 cardinals. So you're, it's, it's literally conclave. You're locked, you're locked in. And um, it's, a, it's a very quiet experience uh, because there's no, except for you hear the people saying the prayer as they reach the altar, but it takes some time for 115 people to go up. And so once you've gone or, or while you're waiting, you just, you just sit there, some are praying the rosary uh, and some are just in silent prayer. So there's no 
no words. And then all you hear after that is one, two, three, or the names, and then you do it again. Speak to us a little more about the spiritual dimension of being in that room for this monumental um, uh, action that you were part of. Well, we were very conscious of all the prayers of the people. In fact, it was mentioned before, there was adopt a cardinal where people could, were just sort of given the names of cardinal to pray for. So this was mentioned a lot among the cardinals that people are out there praying for him, which we knew. And then in the pre-conclave, we spent an hour of adoration before our Lord in the church in St. Peter's. So it was just a very prayerful thing. You start with mass and then you're praying during it. And then you're not talking at all during the conclave. You're just sitting there while the, vote, the voting goes on. And then, so it, and we would, we would begin, then we'd end with the, with the prayer of the church, the divine office. And, and during the conference, people were just simply quiet. It's a very quiet event. But meanwhile, we know that outside, it's very people cheering. And, uh, and of course, the, the thing before was very intense, the very opposite. That's why I'm very glad for a conclave. The, because if you've been there with uh, you know, people with cameras and everything, it's very intense and, and all kinds of speculation about papabile and all this kind of thing. Um, and then it's good just to get away from that. And you enter into a, a spirit, an oasis of kind of silence. And it's just very beautiful. Was it overwhelming on any level for well, you? It was, I think. It was just, I had never thought. I remember a couple of moments when I, when I proclaimed that prayer, you know, you hold the ballot up and say that, I mean, looking up at the last judgment, like, oh my. But what really, a moment that really made me think was when you have the, the master of ceremony says, extra omnes, everybody out. You know, we have the, the beautiful, well, that procession in was very moving. We were all organized according to the place. You know, they, they had it set up like preparing for a head table. You get your place and you end up. Uh, but we, then we start out and they, they hear the chanting of the, the litany of the saints as we're going two by two through this room. And then you turn. And when I made the turn, and you look and there's the last judgment of Michelangelo. I thought, oh my gosh. I, it's hard to believe you're actually doing this. You know, you think... And then you go in, and then they, everyone leaves after the, we swear the oath, and that was all televised. So it's, you know, but then everyone leaves, and then Cardinal uh, Grech, who was one of the over 80 cardinals, he spoke to us. His role was to speak to us about our responsibilities. Then he left. And then Cardinal Harvey shut the doors. He had clunk. And, and then I remember thinking, oh my, this is it. <laughs> Here we are. And then Cardinal Ray got up and said, we begin. And so we wrote our names and lift them up, and up to the altar we go. Oh, wow, this is amazing. It's just amazing. It's just astonishing. Did you struggle with whose name you would write on that ballot? Well, I think we, I, you know, I certainly prayed and thought a lot about uh, you, when you think of when you're voting for Pope, especially when you, you know, you say what you say when you vote. You, you take it very seriously. And I've been very much listening. Um, well, you try to be attentive, you know, even before, but listening, uh, listening a lot during the pre-conclave and, uh, and to the discussions of listening to other cardinals. So I thought very much, uh, uh, I knew there were, there were some very remarkable cardinals, you know, and just uh, when you look around, it just, uh, it is, it's a bit of a difficulty of finding, like which one is, is the one that, well, which one do you truly believe should be elected? That's what you have to answer that question. So when the moment comes and you, you have to then write a name, not, not five names, but one name, yeah, you just think and then you put it down. And uh, then away you go. It's quite something. Oh, it is, it's just amazing. And it's, it's sort of, um, like it's hard to keep saying it's sort of a spiritual experience, but it's a very quiet experience. Like the actual conclave, the pre-conclave, with uh, going in and out, especially, I just walk over from the, I'd say one of the residences in Rome, there's three of them for priests basically, uh, one of them Santa Martha where the Pope is staying now, it's right in the Vatican, the other is a place called Casa del Clero of Via Trasmontina where I usually stay, it's about 10, 15 minutes away, so I put my robes on and walk over there, and there's uh, cameras and you know, excitement and you're working your way through and you know, huge crowds and everything, so that whole week was very intense. But then when you get into the conclave, it's silent. And that's quite a change. And that's the way it should be, too. It's, it's to avoid distraction. 
And then uh, some one cardinal once said when discussing in the pre-conclave, he was saying, you know, all this speculation, but this will be decided during the conclave, which I thought was a lot of wisdom to that. Yeah. You, um, you said that you were there writing off the, making the marks as they yeah, read out the names. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when it became clear that he was the Pope, mm -hmm. how did you react? What can you tell us about well, that? Well, like everyone else, I, I clapped. Um, although he's not the Pope yet, even when he gets 77 votes. Um, he's just possibly the Pope. So we finished the, the, the voting until all the votes were, were finished. And then, I tell you, they checked them and double checked them. <laughs> we don't. And so they were going through, you know, one, two, to be sure. And then they read out the names, you know. And then they, the revisers, there's three more cardinals, count them again. And then once they have, they write on a sheet of paper, and this time they started from the least to ending up with Bergoglio. And then when they read out his number, which was more than we know, I can say without fear of excommunication, was more than 77. Um, at that point, um, we were all just uh, kind of thrilled, you know, and interested. And then he was over in the corner. He was the back wall, left side as you face the thing, two from the last judgment, that side. And I remember seeing uh, Cardinal Humes, who was on his side, just a bit before he was, um, after the vote, but before he was called up by Cardinal Ray, just lean over like this and then lean back. And uh, I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what he was saying. But and then at that, as soon as he did that, Cardinal Borgoglio got up and Cardinal Ray called him forward to stand in the center. And, uh, and then he read out, again, not reveal, it's, just, it's in the book, the, what you say. Uh, basically, you have been canonically elected. Uh, Pope, do you accept? And then uh, uh, Cardinal Borgoglio, certainly one thing he said was, I accept, uh, because he's the Pope. Uh, and then he asked, what name do you choose? And he said, uh, in honor of Francis of Assisi, I choose Francis. And he said himself later, like I can tell that, that, that just before I was called up, Cardinal Humes leaned over to me, and I remember seeing him do it. And he said, remember the poor, remember the vulnerable. And so it, he uh, said that's when he decided on Francis. That quickly. So it was right about, there. I would say probably about 10 seconds before he picked the name. It, it is, really is this way, you know. This is quite remarkable. No, it is, you know? Well, it's really, it's sort of it's amazing, really great to you know? hear the, the, the little sort of, things. I mean, so. I don't know. He may, because he could probably see it getting closer. He may have been thinking of this before, but I think that's probably when he picked the name. Now, we have seen him in the, this short time that he mm -hmm. has been Pope. Um, uh, we've, we've caught some very interesting glimpses mm -hmm. of him. Uh, shortly after he became Pope, it was Holy Thursday, he gives Mass and he washes the feet mm -hmm. of in men who are incarcerated prisoners. Yes, right. um, he uh, was in the Pope Mobile just a few days ago and there was a boy with Down syndrome oh, yeah. and he Brought invited him, him in, but it. the kids sit in the chair and spin around. Um, yeah. uh, d w what should we take from these little glimpses of him with, with people? What, what does this tell us about who he is? Well, I think we all get to know him more and more as the time goes by. And, but he is, uh, what you see is what you get. You know, what, it's, it's there, it's just him. And it's what he's been like for years and years as bishop in Buenos Aires. Um, he's a very, um, like he's a real, uh, very engaged bishop. Um, and he even, you know, speaks himself as bishop. And one thing, I think when he went to the, he went to visit the parish, and he told the people, the Pope's in the Vatican, I'm your bishop here. You know, so the, in the Vatican deals, but he was there with them. And so that's a, this is the kind of, somebody says like a parish priest, like at the, at the uh, like priests are like this all over the world. Like the, the caring, loving of the people. This, he's just a very personal, like um, pastoral uh, kind of bishop type. That's his strength, his experience too. That's his particular part. His mission in, in, in life has been that. At the same time, he has signaled that he is ready to tackle tough reforms, that he's ready yes, to look at yeah. the bureaucracy that you've all agreed there needs to be some work done there. He's got a committee of eight. What yeah. should we watch for in mm -hmm. terms of the, of the bureaucratic side of this very, uh, very important institution that, mm -hmm. that has had issues? Well, I think there have been difficulties. Obviously, you hear about these, uh, all these different, you know, vatty leaks and all this kind of stuff, you know, and it seems sometimes that the, like it's not, it, it, I remember once when I was in Rome, 
years ago when I was just studying there the first time, um, a Canadian diplomat came and said, I've always wanted to be in the Vatican. It's just like a well-oiled machine. The Pope gives the orders, the cardinals, then the bishop, the priests, and the people just move like that, ticking away like and I said, you've just arrived, haven't you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> because in fact, it's, uh, uh, there's all kinds of things that need to be done. And in a sense, there, the popes have been very engaged in other things for the last 30 years. Um, in apostolic journeys and evangelizing the world and in, in the mission of teaching, all of which have been a great blessing for the church. But you also, it's good, one thing what is also in due time, you, you try to get different talents and benefits. One thing that's also another piece that is important is to be actually kind of uh, watching over the, the, the running of the, the Vatican. And that, so I think he's, he doesn't, uh, he seems to be not so much doing those other things so much as, as caring for those issues. But he's not acting precipitously. He didn't just sort of within a week say, well, I'll start you know, doing this or that. Although it's interesting though, because when a pope uh, dies or, or retires, all of the heads of the departments, they lose their position. Uh, the, the number two ones keep their position. And then when the new one pope comes in, he usually temporarily reinstates the, the top ones. Uh, but, this, but Pope Francis temporarily reinstated everybody. So everybody's temporary. Um, and so um, I presume, though, he's taking time, though, to uh, look at this. And so we presume he'll make some changes. I don't know what they'll be, but uh, he's consulting. We are almost out of time, but okay. I'd like to hear yeah. a little bit of, um, of the insights and the spiritual uh, insights that you have brought home from that experience and how you are, are sharing it here, here at home. Well, it, it, it just was an awesome experience. And I think I've, had a, I've gained a great deal of appreciation, I think, for, for one thing, for the College of Cardinals. When I was sitting there hour after hour after hour, which as you might say was rather mind-numbing in some way, just speech after speech, but listening to these, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, wisdom there, which I think has been, I, I wasn't aware of so much. I didn't know them that well. So that's been, an, I appreciate that very much. I think also, it's very true that, that we need to, Aristotle used to speak about, if you want to communicate, you always have to do this. It's ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos means build the bridge. Pathos, touch the heart. Logos, give the message. So always it's that order, build the bridge, touch the heart, give the message. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. And I think Pope Francis is giving the message uh, but he also has that capacity, which everyone is observing, through simple, just being himself, to build a bridge of trust and of love um, with people. He's, he's, that is, after all, what the title of Pope is, is pontiff, build, bridge builder. So he's building the bridge, he's touching the heart through simple stories and talking what his grandmother said and things like that. It's, it's just great. And, um, and then he's also giving the message. And I think that order is a, a sensible one. And uh, I think that's, we, can, we can all learn from Pope Francis in that. Have you invited him to Toronto? <laughs> no, no, I haven't. I, should fly him. I have a feeling, I, I, you know, I could, but I, I have a feeling he's going to probably be sticking around Rome more. Um, I don't know, but I, I maybe should try. Say, go on to Toronto. And I'd probably, so he said, fine, put, put the invitation on the stack on my desk, I probably, but I don't know, I haven't thought of that. I, I think it's probably, uh, probably good for him to, he's going to World Youth Day, uh, but that's about it. There may be one or two other things. I think he's generally gonna stay in Rome, he seems to be, from what I know, um, and just uh, work from there. As you, you said, sensible. this was a, an historic moment. It would have been anyway, um, yeah. but to have a pope retire first time in mm -hmm. 600 years mm -hmm. and for you to be part of it and to share these little moments with mm -hmm. us to give us more insight, thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Mr. Lou Natale, Managing Director of the NBV Group and Director of the Empire Club of Canada, to say the appreciation. Thank you, Noble. Cardinal Collins, 
being Italian, I had a real struggle with calling you Cardinal Collins. I wanted to call you Cardinal Tommaso Collini, but <laughs> uh, we'll Good stick with <laughs> So I watched 250 people. We're all over 21, some of us anyway. And all transfixed talking, listening to your story and the questions. You talked about smoke signals mm -hmm. in a day of smartphones, and I never, I never once saw someone going like this. So, my father used to tell stories. My, my wife is sitting right there, so oh, please don't. And I picked that up as well. But it still is very important to tell the story and transfix and, uh, as a way to pass on. The other part is the personality, your personality, the uh, personality of the uh, Pope, and Father Vito here, who is uh, my favorite priest, and now he has some competition with you, but they, they inspire people by conveying a message. And it's not just the words, it's the passion, et cetera. So it has been really a very, very interesting and a fascinating experience for me, and I'm sure for the rest of the crowd. And uh, to watch 250 people listen to a story that is now, according to Lisa, that's not news anymore, right? Because it's three, four months ago, but still transfixed with one of the most closely guarded secrets on, uh, on Earth. So thank you very, very much on behalf of the Empire Club and the guests here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a final few things. I'd like to thank Miller Thompson, LLP, a great friend of the Catholic Church and a great law firm in, in Canada uh, for sponsoring today's event. Uh, I'd also like to thank IBK Capital Corporation for sponsoring our VIP reception. I'd like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV. We're, go we're very grateful uh, to Rogers TV for your ongoing support. Uh, also, uh, new uh, at today's luncheons, we have cookies. They're empire cookies, uh, baked uh, by one of our volunteers uh, who spent 12 hours doing that over the last couple of days. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, and enjoy those. We're now on Twitter and on Facebook, and as well, we have our own website, which is empireclub.org, where membership information is available. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned.